Please open in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I'll be reading verses 20, or excuse me, 1 through 28. Please stand with me as we honor the Lord through His Word. And as we consider the nature of the importance of the resurrection as the Apostle Paul brought it forth to those in Corinth who were wrestling with the very concept of uh, a human and bodily resurrection, not so much res- wrestling with Christ's resurrection, although they misunderstood it, misapplied it, and therefore they were un- unable to truly understand what the Lord was doing in them or, or what the resurrection ultimately looked forward to. So let's read these verses, verses 1 through 28, and then we'll look at verses 20 through 28 this morning. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so also you believe. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Then also, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. And then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God might be all in all. Please be seated. Eric Sauer says this, The present age is Easter time. It begins with the resurrection of the redeemed and it ends with the resurrection of the redeemed. Excuse me, it begins with the resurrection of the redeemer and ends with the resurrection of the redeemed. Between lies the spiritual resurrection of those who call who are called into life through Christ. So we live between two Easter's. The power of the, in the power of the first Easter, we go to meet the last Easter. Now, if you were to look around at the world this morning through human eyes, You would see chaos in politics, insecurity in economics, destruction and death abroad, moral collapse at home. But we are in need of a different perspective this morning, one which views all of life through the lens of the single most significant event in all of human history, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Christ has set into motion an unstoppable chain of events which will inevitably result in the resurrection of God's people, the complete defeat of all evil in the universe, both human and demonic, the final defeat of death itself, the exaltation of Christ as the king of the universe, and the summing up of all things in Christ to the glory of God the Father alone. The resurrection of Christ has determined our existence for all of time and eternity. 
We do not merely live out our length of days and then have the hope of the resurrection as some kind of addendum. Rather, Christ's resurrection has set in motion these inexorable events that absolutely determine our present and our future that ought to reform the way we currently live and reshape our worship into seasons of unbridled rejoicing. We have the precious privilege of coming together to rejoice this morning, and yet, really, it's simply a culmination of our continual rejoicing in what God has done in raising Christ. And so what we'll see this morning is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of God's ultimate triumph and empowers us to live with hope, joy, love, and passionate evangelism until Christ returns again. Again, this morning we will see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of God's ultimate triumph and it empowers us to live with hope, joy, love, and a passionate evangelism until Christ returns again. In 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul really, the, it's the classic passage on the resurrection, and he, there are so many facets of it that he lays out, we will be focusing on verses 20 to 28, which talk about the reality of the resurrection, the humanity of the resurrection, the order, the triumph, and the glory of the resurrection. Let's first look at the reality of the resurrection, and we're going to begin in verse 20. As we come to this verse... Paul has just finished telling the Corinthians that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our faith is worthless, we are still in our sins, and we are the greatest fools in the world. But he begins this verse with words that comfort our hearts. And one of, one of the best words in the Bible, the word, but, these, those three little words, but now Christ has been raised. We have not hoped in vain. Our, our, our hope in, in an eternal life is absolute reality because of the reality of of what happened to Christ. And the resurrection of Christ then is not, it's not some kind of mythical account. It's, it's not a, a spiritual resurrection only, which we have this idea where he has, he has conquered uh, somehow in a spiritual way sin, but has not in any actual way, in any physical way, overcome death. The resurrection of Christ is a, an, has, an historical reality. That is, he burst from the tomb on the third day. He burst from the tomb in a resurrected body. This was for real. This was an actual resurrection. In the verses that I already read, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, the Apostle Paul appeals to the reality of that. He says, look, this is the gospel that I preach to you. This is what you hold fast to. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day. All of this according to the scriptures. And then that he appeared. Again, not some kind of ethereal or, or spiritual only resurrection, but a, a bodily, physical, and spiritual resurrection in which he was able to be viewed and seen and touched by those to whom he appeared after that resurrection. The resurrection is grounded in physicality. It is grounded in humanity. It is grounded in reality. The resurrection is spoken of in Scripture. The Word of God has spoken, Christ is raised. The resurrection is attested to by the fact that the tomb is empty. You will find no bones. You will find no body. The resurrection is attested to and witnessed to by those who saw Christ and those who wrote down then their, the, the appearances of Christ and the words of Christ after his resurrection. And the resurrection is attested to by the fact that the world has been changed. That nothing has been the same since the time that Christ burst from the tomb. His apostles were different and those who follow after were different all because of the fact that Christ is not dead. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, this resurrection that Christ underwent, this historical reality, being granted a new or, or having a, a renewed glorified body as he came from the tomb, this resurrection is different from all of the other resurrections or all of the, the, uh, those who were raised to life before the time of Christ because Christ was raised never to die again. Not the temporary resurrections of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha, the widow's son, Elisha's bones. Even in the ministry of Jesus as he raised Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, and Lazarus, all of those were raised to die again. A revelation, or Romans 6, 9 says this, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death is no longer master over him. He conquered death completely. He would never again die. They would, he would rise. He is risen for all of eternity. So this resurrection is a reality. It is experienced. It was real in that time. It is experienced now as Christ is alive and continues to intercede for us, continues to do his work. Well, the resurrection of Christ is a reality, an historical reality, something that happened in time and in space, was witnessed by people. 
And therefore, Paul's entire argument here is that the resurrection of believers is also a reality, but that it is a future reality. The resurrection of believers is future. For Christ, he says, is the first fruits. So back in verse 20, but now Christ has been raised, and he's been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. This really kind of refers back to the sacrificial system and, and really in the Old Testament when there was harvest time, the people of Israel were required to take the first of that harvest. When, when they began to receive the first part of the crops that would come, they were to take those and offer those to the Lord because the, the first product of the harvest was the promise that there would be the rest of the harvest. And so they would take it in, in hope. They would take it believing that the Lord would provide the rest. Well, that's how we view Jesus' resurrection. He is the first fruits. He is the first one to rise from the dead. And that is the promise of the rest who will rise from the dead. And, and notice how believers are referred to here. He is the first fruits of those who are asleep. Not, not of those who are dead. Not of those who even have died or those who will die. Those who are asleep. And this is a special term that the Bible uses for believers who die. Because when we consider sleep, sleep is something that is temporary. You enter into sleep and then you exit out of sleep. Sleep, in fact, is something ultimately that is, that is even beneficial. It is not something that is to be feared. It is something that is, in fact, even to be welcomed. So the idea of sleep is that believers will, will not experience the fullness of or, or the eternal nature of death. It is only their bodies, ultimately, that die physically. They, when they die, will, their spirits, will go to be with the Lord immediately. And it is their bodies, essentially, that rest in the tomb. Jesus says said this when he was going to go and raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had already died. Jesus had waited while Lazarus was sick ultimately for him to die so that he might go and raise him from the dead, demonstrating his power over death. In John 11, 11, Jesus said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. And that term had not been used for death before. And the disciples hearing it thought that Jesus was saying that Lazarus was actually sleeping. And they're like, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll wake up. Why do we need to go? That doesn't make any sense. And it says, no, Jesus was speaking of the fact that Lazarus had died. He was really coining the term, making it a term for believers that our death is only sleep. This sleep indicates a state in which believer spirits are with the Lord. Their bodies are in the tomb. They will rise from sleep, as it were, when their bodies are reunited with their spirits. Now, again, we know from Scripture then when it says that... that believers sleep. It is not their souls who are sleeping. It's not as though somehow we pass off the scene into kind of a, a quasi-spiritual state where nothing is happening and then at the resurrection we kind of wake to consciousness again. No. 2 Corinthians 5 8 is clear. We are of good courage, says Paul, and I prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So when a believer, when his body dies his spirit goes to be immediately with Christ. Philippians 1 21 through 23 says the same thing. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not wish to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. To depart from the body is to be with Christ. But make no mistake, that the body doesn't follow. The body is, in fact, in the tomb. The body then decomposes in the tomb. And it is that that is really referred to as, as the sleep. The body is at rest. The body is not active until such time as Christ returns again to raise the body and then rejoin our bodies with our spirits. And we'll speak more of that in a moment. Jesus is the first fruits of this resurrection. He is the first one to truly conquer death. He will not be the last. His is the first ingathering of a bountiful harvest of resurrected believers. And in Christ again, it's all put together perfectly. His body died on the cross, and yet then he burst from the tomb with a renewed body, with a glorified body, like the ones that we will ultimately have, his spirit, his human spirit, being reunited with that body. So he is the first fruits, the perfect picture of all that will come. And the fact that he is risen means that all who are in him will rise again as well. In a general sense, then, this idea of first fruits is that the status of Christ's followers is changed by whatever their first fruits undergoes, by whatever Christ undergoes. And in the specific case of the resurrection, their resurrection is not merely parallel or similar to Christ's, but it is pre-authorized, promised, guaranteed, and initiated by it. That's the nature of Christ being the first fruits. If he rose, he is the, the first of the harvest 
of all of those men who are in Christ who will one day rise again, their bodies being reunited with their spirits, and they're going to be forever with the Lord. This morning we celebrate the resurrection that is an historical reality and that is a future reality. Nothing can take it from us. Unless Christ somehow to be able to die even now, then could our resurrection be taken, but it's impossible. He is alive, he remains forever and eternally alive, and he is the first fruits then of all who will be raised to life in him. That's what we celebrate. That's why we come. And that is great joy. But there is more. There is more. The resurrection is not only about our individual and personal revival or resurrection or our bodies being revived. It is really about the culmination of the glory of God in the entire universe. That's what this is all about. And that's why I chose this passage. It is enough, I would suppose, that we could come rejoicing that we will live forever. Is it not? Just rejoicing in that would be enough. But there is more than that. And that's what we celebrate. He doesn't just you know, allow us to rise from the dead and then everything else to go to pieces. And somehow we will somehow live and, and yet everything else is out of God's control and we'll just kind of barely make it through. He'll, he'll raise us together with him and then we'll kind of stumble into eternity. No, the resurrection proves that Christ will conquer everything that is evil, all sinful powers. He will also revive and renew everything that is so that everything gives glory to him. There's a bigger picture here this morning and it causes even greater rejoicing. It causes us to be reminded again that God is to be our ultimate glory. That's where all of this is moving. And so we glory in our new life. We glory in our eternal life, but we glory even more in the fact that that new and eternal life gives glory alone to the God of the universe who deserves it all. That's why we're here. And that's what we're celebrating. And that's what this passage is all about. Because really, verse 20 just opens up the gate, the discussion of Christ's resurrection, then the fact that there will, it is an absolute reality that we will rise. Paul uses that to point then to the future realities, all of them that flow from the resurrection of Jesus. Back in our text then, so that is the reality of the resurrection. But now Paul is going to turn to the humanity of the resurrection because what issue here in 1 Corinthians is not even so much did Christ himself rise, there's really two central issues. Did Christ rise bodily? That is, did he have an actual bodily resurrection? And then do believers then rise in a bodily manner? Will their bodies be reunited with their souls? Is, is this, does this have a reality and a physicality to it? Is it more than just simply kind of an ethereal and spiritual resurrection? Which most likely those of Corinth believe. They believed that, that, there, that Christ had come. They believed, it seems, some or most of them, that he had risen, but in a, in a spiritual fashion, that he had perhaps conquered death in a way that was only spiritual, more of a Gnostic idea. Nothing material, nothing to do with the earth, no, nothing that was related and grounded in history or reality, all of it spiritual, mythical, as it were, which is what the liberals have believed all along. It's how liberal Christianity operates. This isn't real. I mean, come on. I mean, you really believe that a real body is going to come out from the tomb? That it's going to be a real earthly kingdom and, and a real new heavens and new earth? You really believe that stuff? What's the matter with you? The world doesn't believe that. Well, Paul did. Jesus did. And that bodily resurrection, the, the, the human resurrection, is an absolutely essential core to our entire belief. That's what he's about to demonstrate. Look at verse 21. Essentially here... Paul is talking about the fact that the reason that Christ is the first fruits, the reason that his resurrection guarantees our resurrection, is that he came forth from the tomb physically. They denied the bodily resurrection. They seemed to think that Christ's humanity and bodily resurrection were either in doubt or not very important. But Paul now here makes an argument that directly links Christ to Adam. Since Adam was our human representative and through his sin brought death into this world, we needed another human representative to conquer death and to bring life to our humanity. That's his argument. He says here, through one man. By a man came death. That would be Adam. Or really by a human being, I think you, you could say. By a, a man or a human being came death. And really so, or... For this reason then, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. The first man, Adam, brought death. Genesis 2, 17, as God gives Adam his instructions, as he gives him his word, he says, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you will surely die. Not just physical death, he didn't die physically immediately right away. 
but a total and complete spiritual death. His ability to relate to God was broken. He became dead in trespasses and sins. He was unable to respond to God. He was cast out from the presence of God. And ultimately, he, both he and Eve would die physically. The first man brought death. It was God's intent in the creation of humanity to demonstrate how and, and what humanity would look like really for the rest of eternity. He doesn't undo humanity or undo the physical nature even of his creation ultimately. For by a man, or from a man, or through a man came death. Therefore by a man, or really by necessity then, through a man came the resurrection from the dead. If a man died and brought death, then it was necessary for a man to come to overcome death, for a man to rise again, for there to be any proof that we ourselves could ever be raised. That, there, that this is real. A man brought death and therefore a man, it was necessary that a man, and this is Christ, would bring resurrection from the dead. What did Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now, this next statement is absolutely vital. The Corinthians deny the bodily resurrection. They did so by claiming, that the, de by claiming the deity of Christ or, and by ignoring or downplaying his humanity. Paul makes it abundantly clear that only a man can bring resurrection from the dead and thus bodily resurrection is necessitated. Jesus being perfectly and fully God and perfectly and fully man. And now the idea of our being bound up or, or our life being bound in Christ, that is his life being imputed or granted to us, is directly tied to the idea that in Adam we could all die. God is tying everything together. Paul's taking all of this theology and putting it together. For, for how is it right? How is it, how is it proper for if Adam, when Adam died and Adam sinned, that, that would be credited to our account? That's, that's how God created Adam, as our representative head. And therefore it is only right and just and necessary that we have a different or another representative who overcomes death, but that representative also has to be human, as Jesus was fully God and fully man. Otherwise, we do not receive the credit. We cannot receive the credit of his life on our behalf. We received Adam's death, as our, the next statement says. And therefore we must also have a man who goes ahead of us so that we might receive life. For since by a man came death, by a man came the resurrection from the dead. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all we made alive. What is he speaking of here? Again, it wasn't just Adam who died. He brought death. Certainly he was the first one who died spiritually, ultimately then dying physically. But it was more than that. Adam was our representative. And when Adam died, then all men died along with him. His sin, in essence, being imputed or charged to us. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. All in Adam were sinners. All were judged according to the judgment of Adam. All were then tainted with the tainted nature of Adam and all then sin ultimately as Adam did. That's the nature of our state before a holy God. And there's only one way to fix that. If all in Adam die, who, who's in Adam? Every person born into the world. Every human being ever born is human in Adam. And therefore they must have a salvation that comes again. Yes, through perfect and holy God, but also then through a perfect and holy man. So that the life of that man and the righteousness of that man might also then be imputed to us even as the sin of Adam and the death of Adam was given to us as well. So all who are in Adam die and that is all men. Everyone who has ever been born. And so the entire human race is condemned ultimately with the death of Adam unless a change is made. And of course, that's the flip side of, of the resurrection. That's the flip side of the joy that we celebrate this morning. That if you are here this morning only in Adam, that is, having been born once into this world in human form, then you are under the sentence of death that Adam brought. That his death will certainly come to you. That, his spirit, that the taintedness of his nature is already given to you. And that you are sinning just as he did. All of those things. And there's no escape from that on your own. There's no escape from that by anyone other than the perfect God man. So that is the tragic nature of this Sunday that some come Sunday after Sunday, some come only on this Sunday, expecting that perhaps their, their attendance here will bring them life. That won't do it. That perhaps if they would come, that then ultimately if they stand before God, they can say, hey, occasionally I went and I celebrated you. It's not sufficient. 
Because we, we, we are dead in trespasses and sins. In Adam, we are absolutely unable to respond to God. And coming on Sunday mornings, or coming one Sunday morning, or coming a thousand Sunday mornings, will not change the nature of your state before a holy God. You cannot earn, you cannot buy your way in, you cannot do anything that takes you out of spiritual death. There's only one way, and that is to be found in Christ. Because that's the next part of the statement. As in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. And we need to understand the all's there. How many are in Adam? Every single person ever born. How many are in Christ? Those who have been born again. And so that all is all who are in Christ, as he will make very clear. Those who are Christ. It's not all men who will be saved, because all men are not in Christ. Certainly all men will die, because all are in Adam. But all men who are in Christ, all men who through repentance and faith have entered into new life by the work of the Spirit of God and the Word of God within them, all who are in Christ will most certainly be made alive. Because Christ himself has risen. Christ the man the perfect God-man. But notice here again, the issue is, in this case, the relationship of the humanity of Christ to that, then our resurrection being granted. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Charles Haas says it this way, we are in Adam because he was our head and representative and because we share his nature. And we are in Christ because he is our head and representative and because we share his nature through the indwelling spirit. Adam, therefore, is the cause of death because his sin is the judicial ground of our condemnation and because we derive from him a corrupt and enfeebled nature. Christ is the cause of life because his righteousness is the judicial ground for our justification and because we derive from him the Holy Spirit who is the source of life both to the soul and to the body. In each case, one man doing one act cause the consequences of that act to be applied to every other person identified with him. Those who are identified with Adam, every person who has ever been born, are subject to death because of Adam's sinful act. Likewise those, likewise, those who are identified with Christ, every person who has been born again, is subject to resurrection and eternal life because of Christ's righteous act. The humanity of the resurrection is absolutely vital. If Christ did not bodily rise, then no human body will ever burst from the grave. Ever. If it's a spiritual resurrection only, an idea, a concept, a thought, then your bodies will remain in the ground. You will be eternally dead. You will not rise. The humanity of Christ and his bodily resurrection are absolutely essential so that humanity might be saved. That's Paul's argument. That's what he is saying. And so to deny the bodily resurrection, and this is his argument in all of 1 Corinthians 15, is to deny the resurrection at all. Really, it's, it's, we often look at these passages and say, oh, they were denying that Christ rose again. Again, I don't think most of them were. They're saying, that's fine, we believe that Christ rose again, but we don't believe in resurrection for believers because that's weird. That's crazy. In fact, they didn't seem to believe that Christ rose bodily. And Paul is saying, look, if you deny a bodily resurrection, then you are also denying the resurrection of Christ in any real way, and so you are fundamentally eliminating all hope that you have. That's his point. And the world jeers at the resurrection. They jeer at the bodily resurrection. There are many religions who will hold to some kind of spiritual revival. In fact, nearly all of them do. Some kind of spiritual, you know, uh, revival of the soul or merging with nothingness, whatever it's called. Only Christians believe in a true, full, bodily resurrection from the dead, body reunited with soul, ultimately living for eternity in that glorified body and with God through Christ alone. So that is the humanity of the resurrection. It's absolutely essential. But I, I pray that you rejoice in that. Your Savior, the Lord Jesus, is different again from every other Savior. There's no one like Him. There's no one like the God-man. Fully God, so therefore able to bear the penalty. Fully God, so they're therefore able to live perfectly. Fully man, so that He might properly represent us in our nature and that we could actually, in a real way, be delivered, not in some fake, mythical, imaginary way. Your Savior is unique, and that's why there is only one means of salvation. No one else can save, because we aren't playing games. We aren't inventing new religions. We aren't simply coming up with human ideas. God has to actually be appeased from His wrath. There has to actually be a physical resurrection, because we are physical human beings. And that has all been accomplished in Christ. Well, the question, though, might come, and I think it comes in this text that Paul answers, First he says, look, there's the reality. Christ has been raised, you're going to be raised. He's the first fruits, you're the harvest. 
He was a man, and by a man came death. Christ was a man, so by a man came resurrection from the dead. All in Adam die, all in Christ are, are made alive. But the question then comes between verses 22 and 23, why aren't people rising from the dead now? Right? Why don't they go into the tomb and burst out of it? I mean, he's given us life. So why do Christians die at all, seems to be the question. Why aren't they, if, if they do, why aren't they immediately rising from the dead? Because, verse 23 says, there's an order to the resurrection. God has a plan and purpose in mind. He's working it out, and it's not time for the harvest. The first fruits have come. But there's a pause, as it were, between the first fruits and the harvest. Really, the idea is that God is bringing in all those who will be harvested. There are a lot more bodies that need to fall into the grave who fall into the grave believers and who then can be, will, will be the part of that harvest at the end of the age. He has a lot more to be done. So that's why the dead aren't rising now. He says, each in his own order. The word here is very strong. It is to be arranged in a very careful and precise way. It's a military word. When you put the troops out on the field, you have them carefully directed exactly where you want them to be, so they accomplish the purpose. Jesus, God, is accomplishing something in this order of resurrection so that he might, his purpose might ultimately be worked out. God does nothing by accident. They're like, oh, we're waiting now for what? 2,000 plus years. And, and this, this bodily resurrection hasn't happened, so maybe it isn't going to. No. He is waiting. We've already had the first fruits. That's the proof. That's the guarantee. If anyone points and says, well, well, people aren't rising now. People aren't overcoming death now. But Christ did. Historical reality. Therefore, we will. And the only reason we're not rising from the dead now is because God has a purpose to bring in more of his people before he brings that harvest home. That's the idea. Don't everyone mock the fact that all things seem to be progressing as they always have. No, no, people aren't actually rising from the dead now. They will. Because one did. Always, always scripture points us back to the historical reality of that fact. We're not making it up. Go look at the tomb. Go roll away the stone. Go look at the followers of Christ. Read the word. See that this is real. And know that it's coming, but there is an order. Don't forget that. God has a carefully planned order for all that he does, and the resurrection is no different. Because it goes on to say, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ's, and then he gives the time, at his coming. He came the first time, he died, he rose, so that he would be our first fruits, he's coming again, and when he comes again, then we also will rise. So here's the order. It's pretty simple. Christ and then everyone in Christ. Christ and then everyone who belongs to him. At least the concept is the idea that when Christ returns again that those who are in Christ will receive their new bodies. They will have this resurrection. This by the way is a time and sequence reference but the timing is left indefinite. It says after that well, how long has it been? That's been quite some time. It's amazing in the Bible. Little words and, and, and in between verses and in between events can literally be thousands of years. God's timing is his own. And we have to be careful of determining our own times and trying to get everything figured out to exactly when it's going to happen. This often happens with what? Prophecy. It's going to happen then or now. I mean, after that. Well, after that, I mean, someone might have said to Paul, well, I mean, how soon is after that? He's like, maybe in our lifetime with the Apostle Paul seemed to believe it could have been. After that is just after that. It doesn't give us a specific, a specific time frame. It's as long as God wants. It's whenever his order, his time that he has in place is done. And when that happens, then there will be a resurrection of all believers. And that Bible calls this the first resurrection. And in fact, that's the only thing that is in view in this particular passage. Unbelievers are not in view, essentially. It is believers that are in view. So Paul doesn't deal with other aspects of the resurrection. Really, there's something called the second resurrection resurrection in, in which unbelievers rise, but he's talking about the first one. And that's the event that's described that we are looking forward to. Titus 2, 13, looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming. That's what we're looking for. That's the next major event because in that event, we will rise. Our whether we are, if we are alive, then our bodies will be changed. If we are dead, then we will be reunited. It's described in 1 Thessalonians 4.15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Those who are alive at the time of Christ's return will instantly be transformed into their glorified bodies. Those who have died will have their bodies reunited with their spirits, with their souls to go and be with the Lord. It's described in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. And so this coming of Christ and the translation or the changing of the saints who are alive and, and the resurrection of the saints who have died is part of the return of Christ. It's part of that first resurrection. Then th there's also an event in Revelation 20 where this is described, another part of this first resurrection after the tribulation period that comes upon the earth and the beast arises and the wrath of God is poured out in Revelation 24, 20 verse 4 John says, Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand and they came to life. There we have it. That's, that's the next part of this first resurrection. And they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Our believers are, are changed, translated, and, and the, the dead are raised. And then after the tribulation, there are these, the souls that were killed during that time, and they are raised from the dead. Those, those who were killed are resurrected, and then all reign together with Christ throughout this thousand years. The, all the rest of the dead, the unbelieving dead, stay dead until the end then of that period of time where they come to life to be judged. So this order is, is laid out in Scripture. It is given for us. Now, all the specifics are not. You might have noticed I didn't talk much about timing. It's purposeful. I'm not sure the exact timing of all of those events or even the events of that first resurrection. But there is that. And, and every person will either again receive a new body uh, directly or receive it after death, put, it putting back to the Spirit. That will happen and then Christ will reign. And that really leads us to our next, or Paul's next point. So, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. And just, just before I move to the next point, what an incredible thought that we whether we are alive or dead, will most certainly, again, be, be raised. And that everything, you know, everything the, the nature of our human condition that causes us grief and difficulty, the nature of our bodies that doesn't work, all of those things, all done, all finished at that time. Because we will be raised bodily to be with our Savior. That is the first resurrection. It is assured, but it comes when Christ comes. It isn't now. We do not know exactly when that will be. We know that it is the next event on God's calendar and scripture over and over and over says it is soon, it is coming quickly, it is imminent. And so we await it, looking for our new bodies and looking for the opportunity to live and to reign with Christ. Well, that leads us to the next point, the triumph of the resurrection. The triumph. Well, what happens during this time? So even here, we are given kind of a, a time reference in verse 24. It says, and then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. And it's like, okay, there's the end. How exactly does this end work? Well, there's a series of things that happen in this end. Just as there is a, a, a period of time between the first fruits, Christ being raised, and then the first resurrection, believers, the harvest, so in this end, or so before this end comes, even after the resurrection, there's a period of time in which everything that needs to happen is finally finished, where all of the evil powers, rulers, and authorities are fully subjected to God, with the last one being death. It's all bound up here, and then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. Verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. So we see three last things that happen as the end comes about. First, the last kingdom is established. The last kingdom is established. He's going to hand over the kingdom to the God and Father, perhaps better understood here, to his God and Father. And the kingdom that Christ delivers up will be a redeemed environment and dwelt by his redeemed people. Those who have become eternal subjects of the everlasting kingdom through faith 
in him. This end is clearly identified as a time when the events of the kingdom are completely finished. Everything is wrapped up. All rule and authority are given directly to God the Father. Now, again, he's always had this. There's a sense in which certainly God has always been in control. He's always been the king of the universe. There's a sense also in which since the moment that Christ rose from the dead, he has been ruling. He has been in charge of all things. And yet look around you today. Do we see all enemies subjected to Christ? Do we see all foreign powers bending the knee to the one King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Do we see Satan himself completely defeated and, and out of the way and in the lake of fire? We do not see those things. We await those and that is what Christ finishes after our resurrection. There is work to be done and so as he raises us to rule and reign with him, he then abolishes all rule and authority. Notice that this kingdom cannot be handed over. It will not be handed over to the Father until all authority, and he has abolished all other, as it were, rule and authority and power. He must reign, that is Christ, until all, he has put all his enemies under his feet. And so we look for that day as well. And we understand and know that that will happen. He must fully and completely reign. He is building and bringing in his church now. He will return again. The resurrection happens at that point, and then the kingdom of God is established here on this earth first as a means by which he overcomes and puts down those powers. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. And this is, this is the, the, the blessed joy we have to know that there will be no one and nothing that ultimately stands in opposition to God. And that our resurrection is in fact the proof of that. Notice, that's what he's tying it all to. The fact that Christ rose, that we will rise, means also that everything in the universe will be put in subjection to Christ. In Revelation chapter 20, I already read you the verses that talked about the, the, those who had been killed during the tribulation period coming to life. The rest of the dead, verse 5, don't come to life until the thousand years are completed. And in this thousand years, this thousand year reign of Christ, again, is where Christ exerts his rule, revitalizes the earth, and, and, and declares his power over all enemies. But notice something in verse 7 of Revelation 20. It says, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, and they come up on the broad plain of the earth. They're surrounded by the camp of the saints. They surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Fire comes down from heaven and devours them. Then... At this time, after that thousand year reign, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. After all of the rulers and authorities and powers are subjected to Christ, after ultimately even Satan himself, who was bound during that time, is subjected to the rule of Christ and cast into the lake of fire, never to come out, never to deceive the nations again, never to work his evil on the earth. It is then, verse 11, we could read through it, through 15, there's a final judgment, or really the final, the great white throne judgment, and then in verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. That's what's going on in 1 Corinthians 15, really verses 25 through 28. All of those powers are being subjected to Christ. He is ruling over all. Satan is being finally defeated. All of his enemies are being put underneath his feet. And really this is a promise from both Psalm 110.1 and Psalm 8. In Psalm 110, the psalmist prophesies, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is what's promised. The king must rule. And really, that was a, the, the idea of enemies being a footstool for his feet where the, the enemies were so conquered that the king would be sitting on his throne and literally be propping his feet up upon his defeated enemies. That's the idea. Christ will rule and reign over all authorities. There will be no one who defies him. No nation who shakes the fist at him. No political leader who gives lip service to even Christian things or Bible things and then somehow does those things which are dishonoring and displeasing to God. Not one they will all be subjected to the reign and rule physically in time and space and history and reality to the rule and reign of Christ. Hebrews 2.18, really speaking of this same prophecy in this, in, from Psalm 110.1 and the same idea, says, You have put all things in subjection under his feet, but in subjecting all things to him he left 
nothing that is not subject to him. But now, says the writer of Hebrews, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. We don't. But we will. And the resurrection is the proof of that. So, so don't forget that part of it. Yes, you rising from the dead. Yes, the fact that Christ has risen from the dead. Yes, that you will live with him. But also that every evil power will be totally dominated and ultimately totally destroyed. That's the last kingdom that will be set up. That kingdom then, as Satan is finally defeated and cast into the lake of fire, and just transferring or, or, or really moving into the eternal state with the new heavens and the new earth. What an incredible promise. And along with that then, back in our text, the, the last enemy will be defeated. So all rulers and authorities and powers will be placed underneath Christ, both demonic and human, every evil thing in subjection to him. Then it also says, verse 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. The final thing that is done after all of the, uh, the demonic and human authorities are defeated and subjected is that death itself will be defeated. And that's what Revelation describes with death and Hades being tossed into the lake of fire. Never to, never to return as it were. No more death ever to be upon the earth. No death ever to happen. Nothing, nothing ever that results from the evil nature of Satan or his minions will ever be seen again. The last enemy death is defeated. Isaiah 25 eight. He will swallow up death for all time. The Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. He will remove the reproach of his people from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Just look at our text, 1 Corinthians 15 where it speaks of this, this triumph of death, or triumph over death. But when this perishable will put on imperishable, this mortal will put on immortal, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So we see that the resurrection of Jesus, then the resurrection of his saints when he comes, the establishment of his kingdom, ultimately leads to the uh, abolishment or the defeat of that final enemy, which is death. Well, there's a last thing, one final last thing that's mentioned in our text as well, and that is the last subjection is completed. Just go ahead and write that in and I'm going to explain it. It's very interesting what the Apostle Paul does here. Because really, essentially, at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, at the end of that time, Christ rules and reigns supreme. He alone is the Lord of the universe. Satan has been cast into the lake of fire. No more evil to oppose him. No more evil rulers. Nothing left to oppose Christ. What happens then? Does it end? Is it all finished then? The answer is no. There is something else that happens after all things are subjected to Christ. Look at our text. And it's just both fascinating, amazing, and, 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 and so perfectly in line with all of Scripture that the Apostle Paul mentions this, and I don't want you to miss it. Verse 27, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. It's most likely speaking of God. It's hard to follow the he's and the hymns through this passage, but God has put all things in subjection under the feet of Christ. That's, again, that quote from Psalm 110. But when he says, and that's probably Scripture says, God speaking through Scripture, all things are put in subjection, careful now, it is evident that he is accepted, that his uh, God, the Father, is accepted, who put all things in subjection to him, that is Christ. Yeah, you know, all right, so everything's in subjection to Christ. God enabled that to happen. Christ, through his power, put all those rulers underneath his feet. But there is one thing that's not subjected to Christ, and that is God the Father. When all things, then verse 28, are subjected to him, that is when everything has been subjected to the Son, watch what happens. Then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. What is that about? Now, wait a minute, are we, talk, are we saying that Jesus is somehow inferior to God? That Jesus is somehow less than God and so he subjects himself to the Father because he's of lesser nature or lesser being? Absolutely not. That's heresy. Instead, what is being demonstrated here is the functional relationship within the Trinity where the Son lives always to give fullest glory to the Father. And in fact, this has been true from all of eternity. And so therefore, at the end, the Son does not find it appropriate that He would alone, as it were, be the one who rules and reigns. He purposefully, and as is in relation with His nature from all of eternity, hands that all back over to the Father. Why? Read the last phrase. So that God will be all in all. All glory back to God the Father. Now, it doesn't come apart from being through the Son. 
God does not receive glory apart from the Son. So what does he do? He takes everything in the universe, he subjects it to Christ, so that Christ is, the, is exalted in the entire universe. Ephesians 1 says, everything is summed up in Christ. But it isn't left there. Then, so that God the Father might receive the fullness of the glory, the Son himself, who has been the Son from all of eternity, that is, the one who constantly lives to be in the will, to do the will of his Father, he gives it all back up to God, willingly, purposefully, and totally, so that the universe ends as the universe began. God is all in all. That just takes your breath away. And all of that predicted, or all of that demonstrated, all of that guaranteed by what? The resurrection. There's more than just you rising from the dead. There's more even than just the defeat of every demonic and earthly power. There's more even than just the defeat of death. For all those have a singular purpose. And that is that God may be glorified. That's why he created the entire universe. And so therefore he finishes it out and ends it with God the Father receiving all of the glory. That's your final point. Is the glory of the resurrection. And the glory of the resurrection is that God may be all in all. Do you believe it? Do you, is that what drives every bit of your life again? Not simply that you might live again. Some, some broad, broad or drawn to Christianity on the idea that they might live. And that's an exciting thought. But there is no life, there is no eternal life apart from God being fully glorified. And so even as you come this morning, perhaps as an unbeliever, saying, wow, resurrection from the dead, I'd love to have that. It doesn't come except through giving glory to God. And the only way to give glory to God is to fall on your knees before His Son and to accept the salvation that is granted in Him and therefore to be under His rule and reign when He turns it all back over to the Father. That's absolutely necessary. And it is all again bound up and promised through the resurrection. What does Philippians 2, 9 say? It says, For this reason also God highly exalted Him, that is Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But do you remember the last phrase of Philippians 2.11? To the glory of God the Father. The Son lives to give glory to the Father. Within the Trinity there is a, a rank and order which brings about ultimately the glory of God the Father Himself. And the Son glories in this. And the Spirit glories to give glory to the Son and to the Father. And so this is the pattern. This, this is the picture for us that this is what we are to do as well. The Trinity gives glory to God the Father. We, therefore, are to do the same. And we can do no less. And it is given in Christ. The chief end of man is what? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And the resurrection is both the guarantee and the means by which all of this happens. That's why you have life. You have life so you can glorify God. You have life so that Christ is honored because you have trusted in Him, and the Father is then so honored because you have honored Christ. And therefore, the Son offers all that back up to God Himself. Augustine said it this way, God will be the consummation of all our desiring, the object of our unending vision, of our unlessening love, of our unwearying praise. And in this gift of vision, the response of love, this is the greatest joy of the Son. It is the greatest joy to give the Father ultimate glory by taking what the Father has given to Him and willingly returning it. Thus we see the functional nature of the Son as always willingly subordinate to the Father without ever being less than fully divine. And this is the great mystery and wonder of the Trinity, their desire to bring glory to one another and to live in proper relationship, and to extend that call and give the strength and power for us to do the same. Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How unfathomable His ways. Or who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? Or from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What are you going to do with it? Let me leave you with these challenges. The first, you would rejoice as you leave this morning and celebrate with your family or wherever you're going that you would rejoice in the reality of the resurrection. This is historical. It is, it is human. It is physical. It is real. 
Rejoice in the reality of the resurrection. Christ's in yours. Strengthen your faith in the humanity of the resurrection. The idea that this is not an invention, it's not mythical, it's not spiritual only in that sense, that a man died and brought death, and therefore a man died and rose and brought life. Strengthen your faith in that. This is a different faith than any faith anywhere in the universe, anywhere in the world. Take comfort in the order of the resurrection. Christ has already risen. You will be patient. Be patient. He has work to do, and he has work to do through you. So take comfort in that. He has left you here for a purpose and for a reason. The order of the resurrection is purposeful. Find hope in the triumph of the resurrection, that he will triumph over all rule and authority. That our political leaders that we're in, in so, so much worry and concern about for some good physical reasons, yet ultimately he triumphs over all of them. And they all give glory and honor, whether willingly or unwillingly, as it were, to him. And then lastly, today and every day, proclaim the glory of the resurrection. Proclaim the glory and tell people of the God who is to receive all glory and his gospel so that they might give him glory now and ultimately be part of those who are given back up to God to bring him greatest glory for all of eternity. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our celebration of the resurrection this morning. And I thank you that you are all in all. I pray that we would live in that way and that our remembrance of the resurrection this morning would drive us to find all of our joy and all of our glory in you, subjecting ourselves to you even as does your Son. And that we would exalt the Son, we would exalt Jesus so that you the Father might be glorified. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.